this is a continuation of my earlier lecture on novelty and in the last uh, slide of the last lecture we have seen the prior art reference that should be taken into consideration for the purpose of uh, for the for the purpose of understanding whether an invention is novel or not in this part we will be looking into the tech doctrinal framework the legal framework of novelty we have seen that novelty is the heart of patent law now the principles of the doctrinal framework of novelty is uh, is basically it can be explained in in two it has two element number one first of all the most important understanding is this each limitation claimed in the invention must be present either expressly or inherently in the prior art reference in a single reference to be very precise we are not allowed to combine two different publication or one patent and one publication for the purpose of defeating novelty. The limitation which has been claimed by the patent applicant must be present in a single prior art. It, it, it can be present either expressly, it can, be al it can also be present inherently, but it should be one single prior art. And secondly, the, the reference must be something uh, the, 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 which enables the claimed invention to be practiced by a person having ordinary skill in the art. So, the, the prior art reference which has been referred for the purpose of defeating or holding novelty must not be something which is obscure. So, it must be something which actually by reading the prior art a person knowledgeable in the respective field of the technology would be able to basically practice that invention that is the, that is very very important for the purpose of novelty. Now, here at the outset we also need to understand the fundamental distinction between the concept of novelty and the concept of non-obviousness. When it comes to novelty only one prior art has to be referred and if actually if we are not allowed to combine different prior arts for the purpose of defe defeating the novelty. But when it comes to non-obviousness, in, in non-obviousness inquiry, there are a combination of different scattered prior art references are allowed. However, there are rules that how to, how to actually combine prior arts and when we will be discussing the non-obviousness requirement, we will be coming to that point. Now, as I have said that the most important factor in novelty is this that it may be present expressly. So, directly mentioned in a prior patent application, directly mentioned in a prior publication, it is something which is, uh, which is, being, the, which is being sold in the market for a long time or it is something which forms part of the traditional knowledge of the society that is one. But the, but the most complex doctrine here is the doctrine of inherent anticipation. Now, the concept of prior disclosure under the principles of inherency is very, very difficult to com, uh, comprehend. And uh, see, first of all, uh, the codes are also divided what is the exact scope of the doctrine of inherency. And a claim limitation, uh, the court court is saying, I, I, I am quoting a court case where the court has said, a claim in limitation is inherently anticipated if the limitation is necessarily present in or invariably follows from the reference. Then, another, the, in another case, the court says that inherency does not require that a person of ordinary skill in the art appreciate or recognize the inherent disclosure at the time of the invention. So, all these basically principles of law we will try to understand with the help of an example. Now, here I will be looking at actually an example and the example was regarding an explosive. 
Now, the as you see in this slide, the case name is Atlas powder versus Irico. What has happened here? That actually uh, there was there was an inventor. His name is Dr. Robert Clay. He has actually invented a kind of explosive by by using advanced type of water in water in oil emulsions. Now, after this actually he was a part working with Hanex and then Hanex was having the ownership therein and later on Hanex actually issued a license to Atlas and Atlas was a licensee and Hanex was the licensor. Then what has happened uh, when after obtaining the license Atlas the plaintiff the first plaintiff in this case uh, they filed an infringement action in against Irico. And later after the filing of the case, the, the Hanex itself, the original licensor joined the litigation and they have also obtained the controlling right of the litigation. Now, we will look into the techno explosive technology first and then we will try to find out that what are the uh, new contributions which are being made by Hanex and or Dr. Clay in, the, in this regard and then we will try to understand the court decision in this perspective. Now, as, as we know that any explosive requires two things. First of all, there has to have a fuel and there has to have oxidizers. Now, uh, these, these oxidizers actually they, rapid, they re react very rapidly with the fuel to produce expanding gases and heat and then when the oxidizer reacts with the fuel and it produce gas and heat we call it an explosion. Now, to be very precise uh, composite explosives it, it, it may contain various sources of fuel and oxygen. However, the most commonly used and the most economical composite explosive is called is is actually we know this is called ammonium nitrate and fuel oil ANFO. Now, what does it do? The ammonium nitrate uh, fuel oil it mixes about 94 percent of ni ammonium nitrate with the oxidizer 6 percent of what you call the fuel oil. Now, there are certain problems with this uh, ANFO explosives. So, what are the problems? Number one, uh, if the weather is wet and the wet, wet condition that what will happen? It will, it will dissolve the ammonium nitrate and it will as a result of that since water dissolves ammonium nitrate and then it will make the explosive unusable when someone wants to use this explosive because of the damp and what you call wet weather condition. The ammonium nitrate is basically it would be it would, it would not be working. Secondly, there is another problem. The another problem with this ANFO explosive is this. This ammonium nitrate and fuel oil is a very weak explosive because the interstitial air occupies considerable space in the in the mixture and as a result of this air what happens the 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 the, the, the explosive material actually it is what is happen what happens that it decreases the amount of explosive material per unit of volume because of the air inside because of the air inside what happens the explosive is the amount of explosive per unit volume is very less and in order to address these two problem there are the, 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 the experts they come out with solutions. What kind of solutions they, they come out with? The solution is, num is a very simple solution. Uh, first of all what they will do? They will the, the solution is water in oil emulsions water in oil emulsion what it does? It dissolves this oxidizer into water and then it actually spread it to the oil dispersed it to the, the solution in the oil 
and now what is happening the solution is now surrounded by the uh, the the oil and as a result of that it is actually moisture would not be able to creep into the mixture the oxidizer and thus actually it solves the problem of damp weather it solves the problem of wet weather there is one more thing we have also seen that because of the air inside the volume is dec volume decreases and as a result of this emul emulsion what has happened what happens actually it increases the explosives bulk strength by increasing the density of the explosive material in the mixture so the weak explosive because of this what you call the uh, oxidizer dissolved in water and that uh, solution is actually dispersed over the uh, oil and as a result of that the volume has increased and because of the increased volume now this is no longer an weak explosive but it becomes stronger explosive now however this water in oil emulsion also does have certain difficulties and demerits so, what are the demerits and uh, what you call the difficulties or disadvantages of this oil in emulsion? First of all, this emulsion it would not detonate very easily, it is not that sensitive and, and to be very precise sensitivity here means uh, the sensitivity as I have mentioned in the slide, sensitivity of a blasting composition refers to the ease of igniting its explosion. How easy to what you call ignite the the explosion and because this emulsion is, is although it is a strong uh, what you call because of the increased volume it is a strong explosive but it 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 is not very easy to sensitize the explosion and then what we need to do in order to actually uh, make it uh, experts what they do to sensitize the emulsion to increase the capability of ignition what they do they actually use gassing agent and they sometimes use micro balloons throughout the mixture and what does this balloons micro balloons and gassing agents they do they these micro agents and gassing agent they they, they, they are uh, air bubbles throughout the mixture and upon detonation what has happened the gas pockets the the gas pockets which are being created by adding gassing agents or micro balloons com they, they compress and then heat up and thereby they ignite the fuel around them in other words what happened these actually air the, the places where air bubbles existing these act as hot spot to propagate a powerful explosion so this is the so, this is the problem in the water oil emulsion and the solution which have been provided by the experts. Now, we will come to the claim one of the reissue patent uh, and I will read it to understand the contribution, the so called contribution which has been made by Dr. Clay and who is the patent which is owned by uh, what you call by, by Irico now sorry which is which is basically the the claim the patent which is held by the licensor and which has been licensed to the to irico now i'll read out a blasting composition consisting essentially 10 to 40 percent by weight of the greasy water in oil emulsion and 60 to 90 percent of a substantially undissolved particulate solid oxidizer salt constituent wherein the emulsion comprises about 3 to 15 percent by weight of water, about 2 to 15 percent of oil, 70 to 90 percent of powerful oxidizer salt comprising ammonium nitrate which may include other pow powerful oxidizer salt, wherein the solid constituent comprising comprises ammonium nitrate and in which sufficient aeration is entrapped to enhance this sensibility, sensitivity to a substantial degree and wherein 
the emulsion component is emulsified by inclusion of 0 0.0, 0 0.1 to 5 percent by weight based on the total composition of oil of an oil in water emulsifier to hold the aqueous content in the disperse or internal phase. What you what now what has happened? Then when this suit was filed, the defendant that is Irico, they, they questioned the validity of this patent. And in order to they, they are questioning that whether this is novel at all. So, in order to defeat the novelty of Atlas Powder's patent, which they, which they hold in the capacity of the licensor, they have cited two different patents, one from the US and the other from the UK. Now, uh, here uh, in this slide, I will be giving a comparative chart between the, the patent, the patent of the plaintiff and the patents which are being cited by the defendant. Now, let us look into the composition of contents in the, in the patent. Now, first of all, clay patent means the plaintiff's patent and Egli patent means the patent which is the US prior art and the Butterworth patent is the patent which is the UK prior art. Now, when it comes to composition content, water in oil emulsion in the plaintiff's patent is 10 to 14, 40 percent. Whereas, in the US prior art, it is 20 to 67 percent. And when it comes to the UK prior art, as you can see, it is 30 to 50 percent. Now, let us come to the other component, this solid ammonium nitrate composition. In, in the plaintiff's actually patent, it is 60 to 90 percent. In the US prior art, it is 33 to 80 percent. And when it comes to the UK prior art, it is 50 to 70 percent. Now, let us look into the other element, the, the emulsion contents. <coughs> now, this comparative chart again tells us actually, uh, we find that when it comes to the, the plaintiff's clay patent, ammonium nitrate is 70 to 90 percent. When it comes to the US prior art, we find it is 5 to 70 percent. And when it comes to the UK prior art, it is 65 to 85 percent. Now, the next component water, in the plaintiff's patent it is 3 to 15 percent, in the U US patent it is 15 to about 15 to about 35 percent, in UK patent it is 7 to 27 percent. And in when it comes to fuel oil, in plaintiff's patent is 2 to 15 percent. And then, you, when it comes to the US patent, it is 5 to 20 percent and then in UK patent is 2 to 7, uh, 27 percent. Emulsifier, in clay patent it is 0 to 1.5, in US patent it is 1 to 5 percent and then in the UK patent it is 0 0.5 to 15 percent. So, as we can see the from this comparative chart, this slide and the next slide, that the ranges which are being mentioned by the plaintiff is also available in the in these two prior art and more or less the ranges are almost same and similar. However, as we will we'll see in the patent claim, the claim number 1, the sufficient aeration interrupt to enhance the sensi enhance sensitivity to a substantial degree, this part was not present in the cited two prior arts. And in respect of this actually, the, the, the plaintiff, the plen plaintiff had claimed novelty and as a result of this a patent was granted. And when they filed the patent infringement suit, the defendant objected that how come this is patented because this, these two prior art, the, they sufficiently disclose the invention which is mentioned in the plaintiff's patent. The plaintiff says now that this what you call what we have seen that 
the sufficient aeration entrapped to en en enhance the sensitivity to a substantial degree, this was not present and this is the novel part of the prior, this, this is the novel part of the plaintiff's invention which was not present in the two cited prior arts. The United States District Court for the District of Wyoming found this limitation inherent in the prior art by interpreting that sufficient aeration, any anyone who is having the knowledge about explosive, he or she would read it, he or she would read it in the prior art, although it has not been expressly mentioned in these two prior arts. So, this interstitial air between the oxidizer particle and the porous air between the oxidizer particle, anyone who is having knowledge about those explosive, they will be construing that this is existing, although this was not expressly indicated in the prior to prior art references. Now, when the district court said that the plaintiff, the, the plaintiff's patent is invalidated, the plaintiff filed an appeal before the Federal Circuit Court of Appeal. And in this, in this regard, I just want to tell mention here that here they do have in the United States a specific court of appeal that deals with all patent appeal and they have a jurisdiction throughout United States. Suppose a case actually from, uh, from a particular district in India will go to the particular high court. Say, for example, if a dispute arises in the district of Pashim the dis the dis whether it is a patent dispute or whether it is a trademark dispute or a dispute relating to uh, family issues, it would go to the high court at Calcutta. But in, in USA also, the, the provision is same, when it relates to other issues, other federal issues, it would go to the respective circuit court of appeal. For example, if something happens in, in, uh, in New York City the, and if it is a matter relating to the federal laws, in that case New York district court would be trying it and from there appeal would lie to the second circuit court of appeal. But if it is a matter involving say patent, in that case the trial would take place in the district court or southern district court, say southern district court of New York. But the appeal would go to Washington DC where the uh, Federal Circuit Court of Appeal, the specialized patent appellate court is situated. Now, it the from, from the trial judgment, the case goes to the Federal Circuit and which is obviously uh, uh, manned by technological experts, those who are having understanding of technology and as well as law, they become judge of that specialized appellate court. Now, here in appeal also the federal circuit court of appeal, they uphold the, they uphold the decision of the district court. And, and to be very precise, in this case, this judgment was written by one of the famous American patent judge, Justice, Justice Ran, Judge Ranjal Lader. And here he, he said that what the district court has said that the Although the limitation was not specifically mentioned in the prior art, but it was inherently a part of the prior art, this actually this holding of the trial court was upheld by the appellate court. Now, here the court lays down the principles of anticipatory uh, uh, and inher inherency by the doctrine of anticipation and this is one of the most important legal principle in patent law. Now, first of all, this is actually a part, the operative part of the judgment. I will read it out and then I will explain the points mentioned here. Now, we have seen, this is, I will read it out first. To invalidate a patent by anticipation, a prior art ref reference normally needs to disclose each and every limitation of the claim. However, a prior art reference may anticipate when the claim limitation or limitations 
not expressly found in that reference are nonetheless inherent in it. Under the principles of inherency, if the prior art necessarily functions in accordance with or includes the claimed limitation it anticipates. Inherency is not necessarily coterminous with the knowledge of those of ordinary skill in the art artisans of ordinary skill may not recognize the inherent characteristics or functioning of the prior art. However, the discovery of a previously appreciated property of a prior art composition or of a scientific explanation for the prior arts functioning does not render the old composition patentably new to the discoverer. So, this is the principle of inherency, we will try to understand. First of all, the court has emphasized that there can be an inherency and this inherency in respect of the of those part which has not been expressly stated in the prior art reference. The court emphasized on the fact whether actually a person knowledgeable in the art by reading the prior art whether he or she is able to anticipate that or not is not the issue. The issue is this that the artisans of ordinary skill may not recognize they may, may not recognize the inherent characteristics of the functioning of the prior art, but still it may be something which is underlying the prior art which has not been expressly stated therein. Now, this is the principle of inherency uh, which is very, very important in patent law. At the outset therefore, we must remember that the claim limitation must not be present in a prior art either in express format or in what you call dormant format or in a format which is not expressed. Now, in addition to that the court also actually come out with the other logic to, diff, to afford the trial court decision and we will be discussing this in an elaborate manner when we discuss the principle of novelty, but uh, at least try to understand it this, this point before we conclude. Uh, this class. Now, what is actually this is called the teaching away rationale and teaching in and teaching away rationale is more frequently used in the non-obviousness doctrine, but what has happened that if one reads the patent specification and the patent application of the US prior art the Agli patent, there is a mention and this is the express line which has been mentioned in the in the patent specification fill all spaces in between each particle to give added density. So, if a expression like this fill all spaces in between each particle to give added density is mentioned in a prior art is it not referring to the 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 air bubble or what you call micro balloon creation micro balloon creation and air bubble creation to basically uh, to, so to sensitize the explosive is it not a part is it not actually in a tacit way is it not been mentioned in the prior art. Therefore, the prior art is not actually the teaching the others te teaching the subsequent developers not to venture into that area rather than it is actually teaching them away from that and they are saying that if you have any other alternative solution please go for it because this solution is something which is a part of my patent which is a part of the prior art. With this I conclude today's lecture.